Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Good morning to you all on this lovely uh, morning. As Councillor Bach just said, ideal for teams meetings as weather like this. OK, uh, first item on the agenda is the apologies for absence. We have received apologies from Councillor Mary Jones. OK, thank you. Uh, second item is declarations of personal and prejudicial interest. Members? No, can't see any. Uh, officers? No, OK. Um, <clears throat> item three is the prohibition of what votes and declarations of party whips, which is the standard for scrutiny anyway. Um, the minutes of the previous meeting. I'm sure we've all read them diligently and um, any questions or comments on them? No, OK, then we come to the item five, which is public questions. Any? Emily, have we had any? No public questions today, Chair, no. OK, um, and then item six is the pre-decision scrutiny uh, for cabinet reports annual budget. Um, now, obviously, counts, uh, Mr. Ben Smith will take us through the budget papers as such, and then obviously the leader, Councillor Rob Stewart, will be there then to answer any political questions. OK, then can I hand over to you, Ben? Thank you, thank you, Chair. By, by, by way of overview, I'm going to say a few few general points first, <clears throat> um, which, which we've sort of begun to touch upon, which is um, it's feeling a bit like nailing proverbial blancmange to the wall this year. I have to admit to being slightly confused as to what year I'm in and what I'm doing, because an awful lot of things are beginning to seg into one. We in local government have a pretty fixed timetable for um, ultimately setting council tax by the 11th of March, and most authorities are within touching distance of us in terms of the dates on which they decide to take reports through. And it is undoubtedly the case that we have some local choices to make ultimately as members, but 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 also have to respond to a whole raft of very well-intentioned and well-meaning national announcements, but which run the risk of perhaps making it difficult to control the overall whilst recognising the, 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 the positives that there are, but also the uncertainties going forward. So I think I ought to say that as a general frontispiece. In terms of the reports in front of you, if I take them as a whole in terms of very briefly, because there's a wadge of papers, Look, the third quarter monitoring report is what it is, and I did in facts at the third quarter, which indicated that on the forecast position, we had about £12 million underspent overall on uh, services and about another £6 million on capital financing. Um, that was the position at third quarter, but the leader and I, as, it, as of all authorities, being in receipt of a letter from Welsh Government, which has indicated there's at least £200 million floating around in the system to be announced in due course. And some of those items we're starting to get formal grant offer letters on, and I will do the courtesy of updating Cabinet when they consider the budget papers on Thursday. But several of those items are yet to have formal grant offers with them. Um, but it undoubtedly means, you know, when you're talking about an order of magnitude of hundreds of millions of pounds and probably more to come, it is safe to say that the third quarter position, which is better than the first and second quarter, is likely to only get better still come out turn. But there are a number of uncertainties which still abound. I find myself nearly in March and I've got no idea what this year's pay award is, let alone next year's. But clearly the direction of travel remains very, very positive in the short run on the third on the third quarter monitoring and more is likely to improve come out turn. And I think the advice that I'm going to give to Cabinet is unchanged. The quantums may change, but it's still appropriate to be looking to tuck money away into the various reserves in due course, assuming the outturn position is fully assured come May. And it's really difficult because all of these reports are complicated and interlock with each other, as you're well aware, but perhaps even more so than usual. The main revenue budget report um, and the MTFP report. So the, the good and the, the good and the mixed and the uncertain. Look, it's the biggest amount of cash money we've had for next year in settlement terms that we've had since Swansea existed since 1996. Um, and it's also good. It's a three year settlement. It gives us absolute certainty in terms of a baseline funding position. But that rosiness is a little bit less exciting when we all anticipate inflation in 7% plus later this year. 
and a settlement which is nine followed by three followed by two well i'm pleased to have loads of money year one i'm a little bit worried about the following years if as is likely inflation remains sticky but um as a treasurer i always like having the money up front so i mustn't grumble too much but the revenue budget report also lists out a number of assumptions and uncertainties as does the mtfp over future pay awards future inflation and what decisions you might ultimately take as a council on council tax. You will be weighing heavily the, the cost of living crisis on households and council tax in itself adds, adds to that. Um, but um, the council is not immune from inflation pressures itself and it's got to weigh an awful lot of things. And yes, you will be making ultimately a decision as council on one year's budget, but you've got three years worth of near certainty, but as many uncertainties as certainties going forward. And the other big thing I draw your attention to in the revenue budget is that um, it's undoubtedly a year where there is an awful lot of base funding going into education and social services, reflecting the national priorities in the settlement, and an awful lot of temporary money going in particularly into the place directorate and the resources directorate as a result of draws from the economic recovery fund and reserves that we set aside in previous years. And in, in isolation, in any normal year, as your Section 151 officer, I would turn up and be a little bit nervous about the size of the draws from earmarked reserves. But of course, it's a £20 million economic recovery fund, which with the likelihood of it getting better come out and is likely to have further added to it as a result of the third quarter and ultimately outturn report. And so given that the economic recovery fund was due to be spent over two years, it's perhaps not a surprise that you've got £12, £13 million pounds being proposed drawn from reserves in the short term. But it is very much the discussion we've had where you need to weigh also those longer term uncertainties given inflation is looking sticky and um, the, the, the national borrowing will at some point have to be paid back. I've been to council two years on the trot saying be prepared for some real terms cuts and some tax rises to come. But it would be churlish will be not to recognise how much money is in the system in the short term in the current year and in next year. The rest of the reports in terms of the capital programme is a, is a refresh and update and is relatively straightforward, albeit again slightly complicated by last minute manoeuvres by the Welsh Government. And it sounds churlish of me to moan about being allocated shares of money. We're going to get about another five million pounds of capital money as a result of that 200 million pound letter, which means we will need to jiggle around the capital programme a little bit again, because you'll remember that um, part of the settlement that I updated in January indicated there was a cut in core capital finance support. So again, all very well intentioned and well meaning and it's loads of money short term, which is great, but it does make it very, very difficult for me to nail the proverbial blancmange to the wall, as I've indicated. And then you have the HRA reports, which are pleasingly rather more simple to consider. A very large HRA capital programme propped up by very large contributions uh, uh, in terms of revenue contributions to capital and uh, borrowing to support the capital programme for growing the housing stock and improving the housing stock. Um, and, and that's the primary driver when you look at the HRA revenue report for the um, recommended increase in rent levels. Um, there is more going into investment in direct revenue contributions to capital and servicing the capital programme than there is um, coming out the other side, as it were, in terms of balancing off. So, so to some extent, I don't want to go too much into the details because I'll eat into too much of the valuable time that the committee may have. I am just going to go back to what I said at the beginning. There is lots of good news in the short term. There is a lot of things that we cannot fully control on the national level. There are a lot of things we can control locally because we've had two really good outturn years and we're likely to have a third one, which does leave us in control of some of our own destiny in the short term. But um, I've never known it quite so uncertain, it, which seems strange given we've had two years of making up as we go along with responding to COVID to some extent. And um, I think part of what we're going to see, because when I came to you previously as a scrutiny panel, I was concerned about the ending of COVID monies and what was going to happen post Brexit and stuff like that. I think what we're now going to see is some of the real tensions as a result of the economic impact of COVID as the cost of repaying it and the impact on society and the supply side issues do put us all as individuals, as members, as households, as taxpayers, as a council, um, somewhat through the somewhat through the mill in terms of cost pressures that we have but but overall much to be positive about but a little bit nervous looking forward that's probably all i want to say before i'd invite the leader to make political comment on it and then something then let you come in and ask me questions on it so apologies it's a bit high level grandstanding in one sense but i think it's 
indicative of not being able to quite nail down quite any of the reports yet. I don't know what's happening with the final position this year. I don't know what's happening with the pay award. I don't know what's happening with inflation. I'm pleased I've got a three year settlement that I can factor in, but I don't know what's going to happen going forward. So I will pause there and with your permission, Chair, hand over to the leader who's probably wanting to come in. Yeah, uh, leader. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And can I thank again Mr Smith and his team for, for the work that they continue to do to try and pull uh, what is a very difficult budget together, given all of the uncertainties that we, we still have. I mean, members will be aware of the announcement by Welsh Government last night in terms of support for households, which followed announcements in England and Scotland. Um, but again, that isn't entirely clear because, again, we are aware of um, a discussions between uh, UK and Welsh Government in terms of whether that was a direct consequential or not. It appears that it may have uh, been a, a plus in one column with an equal minus in another column, so therefore no net benefit uh, to the Welsh Treasury in terms of the, the money, as uh, I understand the um, UK government announcement was funded out of an underspend rather than additional monies being made available. So again, it, it isn't as clear cut as we would expect. And as Mr Smith said, uh, given that we've had funding uh, announcements by Welsh Government, which we are yet to see the, the finer detail of, there are still some uncertainties in there. But having said all that, uh, and of course I would agree with Mr Smith uh, and his caution in terms of future years, because this is a record-breaking settlement and a record-breaking uh, budget by any measure. It sees the largest investment into services ever, uh, and it does stay ahead of the current level of inflation. But as Mr Smith quite rightly said, inflation is on an upward trajectory. Um, we know that wages are not keeping pace with inflation. Again, I think the, the fall in wages was 0.8% or 0.9% this morning, uh, while inflation is, is above 5%. So people are getting poorer. Uh, and that is the, the reality that families across uh, Swansea and Wales uh, see as a result of the current economic uh, national climates. So there are some real risks here. Um, we know that the baseline settlement for years two and three is a lot lower than it is this year. So therefore, we have to be cautious in terms of making sure that we don't uh, hit a cliff edge uh, next year or the year after. And we have to make some sensible provision to make sure that services continue to be funded at that higher level uh, in a sustainable way. Um, and that's that's the, if you like, the strategy that underpins the budget here, which is about doing things cautiously and sensibly, but trying to strike the right balance. But, you know, um, given the 10 years of, uh, you know, national austerity that we have faced, um, this is still a, an extremely positive budget. And I'm very pleased with the, with the items and the elements that this budget will allow us to fund locally and the things that will allow us to do locally. And uh, again, for those who, who've been through the papers, you will see some of those uh, contained in there. So uh, a very, very positive budget, uh, but some real risks for the future. Thank you very much, Leader. Um, can I have any technical questions for Mr Ben Smith first, please? Councillor Jeff Jones. Yes, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Ben. Um, just to be clear, well, it's 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 good news, you know. Uh, so we see nearly all the way with regards to this. You actually mentioned about two hundred million actually washing around. That's across Wales, I'm assuming. And you actually mentioned capital and revenue. I'm assuming that some of it is capital and some of it is revenue and so on. Also, in the papers, you actually mentioned about it hasn't been finalised yet with regards to. Um, shall we say the COVID shortfall and, and also there's a I think there's a mention in there with regards to a two million shortfall in council tax and so on is the 200 million part to actually shall we say uh, you know meet the cost of COVID and the council tax or is it in addition to it It'll come as no surprise, it's a mix of things. So as I've indicated, indeed, yes, it's an unusual one because we have a firm commitment in terms of that 
um, all Wales offer to local government, which is 200 million across a whole raft of things, it's about 70 million nationally for capital. There is a commitment to underpin <clears throat> at least 85% of all council tax losses. There is additional money for social care, winter pressures, and there are continuations and extensions of all of the various hardship funds that we continue to bid for. And we will continue to bid for all the way up to the end of March, and we will finalise in May, which is why I've indicated many of them are uncertain. <clears throat> um, the distribution, for example, on council tax is to be one mutually agreed between all 22 authorities. Um, through the Society of Welsh Treasurers and whilst in a written divvy up hasn't been agreed, um, the discussion was on Friday and I am in a position where I'll be updating Cabinet and indicating that the loss on council tax should be made good again like it was last year. But it is very much indicative, as Councillor Jones said, of a number of things that um, remain uncertain as to being fully nailed down. But I'd repeat what I said before, I'd still rather have a share of those very substantial pots of money and there are likely to be more still to come given the way last year panned out um <clears throat> which 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 means it's uncertain um and as i say i can't even pin down the current year's final position let alone the number of the assumptions for next year and i think that's the bit that worries me the most it's be, be, before the just before the meeting started i was considering you know, my, my 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 role is to give you expert strategic advice as best I can. Ultimately, members will make the policy decisions. But my other duty is to keep strict financial control. And despite the best of intentions for a whole raft of policy announcements at often the 11th or even the nearly the 12th hour, um, they do make it proportionately harder for me to com keep, keep complete control. Because at the end of the day, the budgets are built to the nearest 100 quid. And I've got to do the accounts to the nearest penny. Um, and, and 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 yet the big ticket stuff sort of kind of looks after itself, but there is a real danger that it gets a little bit muddied and confused between what's this year, next year, two years hence, temporary money, one off money, reserve money, temporary money, which will come through the WLGA versus any other route. It It's why I reference that it's a bit like nailing blancmange, but hey, at least there's plenty of blancmange to go around as I'm mixing my metaphors in fury. I did warn members that I'm likely to mix a lot of them today. OK, thank you. Um, sorry, sorry, Chris. Well, can I just ask something else as well? Just uh, I know it may be a, a figure that's um, uh, perhaps difficult to actually convey and so on. You actually mentioned, you know, we, if we actually encounter inflation seven percent, how is that going to, uh, you know, financially going to affect the council? Have we got some sort of idea what sort of additional costs that's going to incur on the council? So, so the budget is built on the basis of my best assessment and obviously the headline figure will be CPI as reported by the papers, but the preferred measure is CPIH. That's the one that's influenced by council tax, which is why it's an interesting policy decision for, for members when they come to council. Um, our biggest spend item is pay and as the leader has indicated, national pay awards. We don't set pay locally, national pay awards uh, in local government, but also in the wider economy are lagging behind headline inflation, which is a, a useful break on spend. Not so useful if you're a member of staff wondering how you're going to juggle your own bills. It's that it's that mix of household versus individual versus society versus council. So um, I've built in assumptions over some central inflation, some future inflation, particularly for energy costs once our, our, our protection unwinds. Um, <clears throat> And it's my best judgment that there is sufficient in the system um, as set out in the budget papers and the medium term financial plan. But you can see a substantial amount of the very large nominal investment is eaten up by some of those real pressures in terms of inflation. But we are unlikely to full face the full 7% headline increase because of the dampening effect on wages and because of the energy contracts we're locked into. But on some things, we face undoubtedly higher pressures or supply side shocks where we can't get hold of materials in the first place. So uh, I'm, I'm satisfied there is sufficient in there. Um, and I do hold a central contingency against inflation, which has set this authority in good stead in recent years. But it worked really well when inflation was a couple of percentage points, not when it was nearing seven percent so it's my best judgment call on the on the matters in front of me inflation will go high it will prove sticky and it will hang around for a period of time but it will eventually return to a degree of normality rather than the 30-year highs we've got so i hope that assures you councillor jones that um what's in the papers in, in front of you gives you my best assessment of those cost pressures 
but it remains very, very uncertain the longer you go out. If this was Bank of England territory and they do one of their infamous fan charts, it would have a very, very wide fan at the longer end of the spectrum. OK, um, Councillor Peter Blair. Thank you, Chair. I'm just trying to work out what a fan chart is, but um, I'm sure Ben will explain that to us. Um, this may be a premature question, but clearly the Welsh Government today announced that they're going to refund £150 um, to every council tax um, band A to D. I'm just wondering, have any discussions taken place with the Welsh Government about how exactly that's going to be rolled out? And when people can, will, will it be taken off the council tax bills that are sent out or, or is, is it going to work out a different way? Because I think it's down to local authorities to pay that money out. Again, I'll come in. I mean, I, it shows how sad I am because I read all the Bank of England inflationary quarter reports with the fan charts, which is basically an estimate range. And it just sort of says it, if inflation could be any figure under the sun, basically, is the is is what the fan charts show. In terms of the other item, yes, it's too early to tell. The, 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 the policy announcement's been made by Welsh Government. I have very strong views over things as a public finance professional and as a public sector economist. Um, I'm going to zip it at that point, which is most unlike me, because there is a danger that some of the comments I make could be construed as unconstitutional and political. But from a design point of view, I am going to get another metaphor in, which is these are all very well intentioned from the UK government, Scottish government and Welsh government. But I'm feeling a bit like it's stop the pigeon and more and more ingenious but slightly futile contraptions are being invented to try and catch the inflation pigeon. Um, <clears throat> all well intentioned, but no one actually quite knows how any of them are quite going to work. And as of this morning, I have absolutely no idea how any of them are going to work in terms of the sequencing. Um, and it's the same case in England. I mean, the announcement was made a couple of weeks ago, and I think fellow treasurers are trying to work out, is it at source? Is it knocked off? How, you know, what do we do for those that weren't paying? There, there, to be fair to the Welsh Government, there are elements of this that are more appealing as a public professional public services professional in terms of targeting. I think I can say that without being accused of a, a, a political slant on it. But 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 it's, it's a scheme that's probably more nuanced than the, uh, the, the Scottish arrangements and the U, UK government's announcements for England. But nuancing comes with multiple layers of complexity. And I am this morning scratching my head as to how I'm going to invent these various schemes, as will 21 other treasurers. And it's far too early to tell at the moment. The, 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 the policy intent is a laudable one, but there's some very unusual policy choices being made by all governments over the mechanism at quite the 11th hour. So I simply cannot answer that question at the moment, which I suspect you you, you understood, Council Black, and I take it in the, in the in the vein and manner in which it was intended of me. Yeah, I'm just interested as well. I mean, I can't remember the proper name of the Council Tax Benefits Scheme. Um, obviously, when we put council tax up, we have to make allowances to put money into that. If we're taking £150 off council tax, what's the impact on that is? So it does seem to me some, some lot of technical questions they haven't really thought through yet. I think there's a lot of technical stuff to work through. It's CTRS, the Council Tax Reduction Scheme, and you're quite right. The the, the update report I took to council last month um, in terms of adoption indicated that on average for every pound we put council tax up, we have to put 23p in on top locally. If you start to unwind that, how does that work? Um, again, treading carefully, one of the bits I do like about the Welsh announcement is obviously a recognition that because of our 21,000 residents, 18,000 were on 100% CTRS relief. So there was a potential flaw in the distribution system without some sort of mechanism. Again, don't know how the mechanism is going to work. <coughs> My understanding of this morning, having had kittens overnight um, <clears throat> about how to make it all work in practice, is that council tax data will be used predominantly as the distribution mechanism for getting the data and for making arrangements. But I think it's so late in the day, it's going to be really difficult to apply an awful lot of these at source, because let's be honest, in two weeks time, council is likely to make a decision on council tax and I should be straight into billing mode. And those of you that sit on audit committee will know that I'm in the strange position where I spend most of my time trying to collect stuff. But at the moment, I'm spending all my time giving stuff away for laudable, understandable policy reasons. But I suspect it's going to be incredibly difficult to have a design solution in two weeks time that works perfectly, despite the policy intentions, which are, of course, laudable by all of the administrations, whether they be in England, UK or Wales or Scotland. Did you understand all that, Peter? As much as, the, as Ben did, yes. Yeah, I think, uh, I think Ben's comments were uh, i have no idea what's going on but i'm going to say what i think might happen right okay leader 
Yeah, j- just really to add to what Mr Smith said, I, I was just going to say, look, clearly the way in which this is being done through council tax is a more complex and a more difficult way of achieving a, a rebate or help to individuals and families. I think that's the core point Mr Smith is making and, and it does make it really difficult to bill um, effectively and to do all of the processes we need to do end of year when you're having this intervention because, of course, uh, this could ease more easily perhaps have been achieved through things like the NI uh, uh, rise being stood down or the uh, £20 per week universal credit cut not being applied. There are lots of more straightforward ways of helping people than, you know, in, including it in a, in a council tax adjustment. And uh, I think from a technical point of view, which is where Mr Smith is coming from, it's, it's much more straightforward to do it through those methods than it would be to muck about with council tax bills. OK. Anyone? Thank you. Thank you, Leader. A- anyone else has got a technical question for Mr. Smith? Jeff? Yes. I, yeah, I, I, I'll have to read some of this, really. It's, it's page 13, actually, D going on to 14. Um, it's actually say, um, mentioning capital finance charges, which I, I must admit I, I, I worry about in the future and so on. At this, uh, at this stage, an underspend variance of six million is forecast, and you know any underspend will actually be transferred to the uh, capital equalisation reserve. Um, it's actually mentioning that you know we've got uh, to lock in two percent long term rates, um, but the envelope debt is now fully externalised. Um, can you, you know, clarify what you mean by that? You know, have we reached our limit there? Um, and it'll actually feed through to higher base capital financing costs, significantly higher. And then it actually says ongoing underspends in this line should no longer be presumed for future years. What exactly do you mean by that in this line? So, <clears throat> The, the, the capital programme and the capital strategy is the capital strategy of council until it changes. On the basis of what has been approved so far, there was a £200 million external borrowing envelope for the general fund. And what I am saying is with the Treasury management activity I've take, undertaken in year, I have borrowed up to that current agreed limit for general fund purposes and borrowed the whole lot before interest rates have gone up not already and are likely to go up significantly more. So we've got the certainty locked in. You've had several years of very substantial underspend on that capital financing line. The the, the clear messaging I'm giving there in the third quarter is I've borrowed a hundred and something million pounds in year on top of the the other amounts. So you cannot assume you're going to constantly underspend by five, six, seven million pounds on that budget line. The budget line was built in the MTFP to ensure we had those stepped increases rather than a sudden escalator, elevator or cliff edge effect. So it's a clear warning to council ultimately, that you cannot rely on that sort of magnitude in all future years. But if council decides in the future to change its capital programme and add to it, there may be an ask for more borrowing in due course, or there may not be. I will give professional advice at the time as to what I think is affordable. The eagle-eyed will look across the various reports and work out that that's all about the general fund. There are still significant amounts of borrowing to be undertaken by the HRA. Um, And I can't borrow in advance of need, but that is part of the driver for the revenue increases proposed in the HRA. It's about the capital investment and the capital programme, both direct capital financing and some of the borrowing to be undertaken. And you will still see some modest increases in in the um, capital financing line in the general fund. And that's predominantly because whilst the borrowing envelope has been done for city deal and city centre, there are still commitments under band B schools where the council's position is schools will not pay for it, the authority will as a whole. And there is the mutual investment model, which is a sort of revenue charge, but is, is quasi capital financing uh, to be to be fitted in. It goes back to the point I made at the beginning that, I mean, you all know that these reports are complicated and interlocking. They're doubly and triply interlocking given the uncertainties in the current year. So I, I hope that helps clarify it because this is this is an item that for all the other items I've said, we're uncertain as to what's happening. This is one that's doubly complicated in terms of a position which is you, you've had several years of underspending to put into the capital equalisation reserve to fund future commitments to make sure we smooth the costs. So probably pause there, otherwise you'll you'll all get bored to be talking about the capital equalisation reserve again. But that's what it's meant to be predominantly about, Councillor Jones, a signal that because I've externalised all of the general fund debt and the MR 
RP payments are going to have to be made in future years, you will not have that level of underspend that you've grown used to as a council for several years. I still expect there to be some underspend, but it will not be of that quantum. I hope that helps clarify the position. Yes, great. Thank you. OK. Anyone else with technical questions? Ben, I have one on, on 4.17, table one. You give the cash position, the gross care or budget uh, in it, in, in, within the body of that um, that uh, table, you give general inflation, there's nothing alongside it. So wh why, why hasn't you put a note in there to say that it's going to be co-funded centrally? Uh, apologies, Chair. I didn't catch what item you had drawn my attention to. Oh, table one, um, paragraph 4.17, table one. Impact on budget school delegate budgets. <clears throat> you put uh, nothing apologies. in there for general inflation. I'm afraid I've got so many reports open, Chair. I've still failed to identify what page you're on in the revenue page. Could you, is the page number at the bottom? Apologies for being so dull today. Oh, I can't find out the page. This it, is on page 63 of the Delegated Schools Budget, Chris. Is that that's what, that's what I That's what I've got here. Under school prioritisation, it is. Yes, yeah, it's, it's page 63 on, on the Cabinet report. Um, and it's the impact on schools delegated budgets table. Ah, yeah, thank you for that. I see what you're saying. Yeah, so, so so overall, I mean, it's not that there's none provided for. That's meant to be a position which is indicating as we advised the school budget forum and as we advised head teachers that we were making provision for as well as the pay awards enough in the delegated sum to fund schools for 4% inflation um, uh, uh, on, on their non-staffing budgets and an indication that we would be providing ongoing support in future years as the energy bills start to heal. As, as, as you're aware from discussions we've had previously, there is some support and protection as a result of cap and collar arrangements that we've entered into in terms of with our suppliers. So it's not that it's blank and there's no provision. It is indicating to schools that we were able to provide them with 4% uplift for, for general inflation, but we recognise that they also face very, very real pressures and um, like all departments, I hold a central inflation provision and all directorates can bid against it. It's more complicated for schools because of the delegated budgets, but there is no impediment to schools equally potentially coming back to myself as the Section 151 officer. And if the sums are large, back to Cabinet for a decision in year to release sums from that. As you've seen in the in the, in the budget monitoring report, there's, there's that central inflation provision in the current year, which we haven't fully utilised. That's when inflation's been 2%. As we anticipate inflation hitting 7%, I can very much foresee most, if not all, of that central inflation provision needing to be handed out to directorates. And it's not beyond possibility that that would include schools. Um, it'll be done on a needs base, evidence base as we as we as we get there. It's just part of the general cushioning and provisioning I have around the budgets. And it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because as treasurer, I want as much as possible in those central pots. I want as much in contingency, as much on balance sheet, as much in provisions, as much in reserves. Um, members tend to want to put as much as possible into service budgets, including schools. And I think we've got an appropriate balance between the two, given the real risks that are bound around budget in current year and future years. Um, my profuse apologies for taking three attempts at getting to the right page, Chair. OK, that's not a problem. Um, I just think that it, you know, it, <clears throat> OK, we know about it, but it, it, it does come out as very, you know, oh, we're not including anything for inflation. So I think that that's the point I'm trying to make. I, I, Chair, I do accept that, and I think um, that can be tidied up or explained in terms of the cosmetics, but I think it would also be right of me to indicate that the discussions we've had as officers and members with the, both the School Budget Forum and head teachers are that they, they understand the overall position and are pleased with the overall position, as I understand, is the relevant scrutiny panel. And whilst we don't yet have the School Budget Forum's formal response as a statutory consultee, mm -hmm. I would be surprised if it's anything other than very positive around the overall arrangement. So, um, I, I don't think there's a risk that schools will misunderstand that, but but I'm more than happy to try and tidy that up to make sure there's no risk of that being misconstrued by anyone. And I thank you for drawing that to my attention, Chair. OK, thank you. Uh, anyone else though with the, any comments regarding the technical issues? OK, there are a couple of others. 
bear in which I'll, I'll, but I'll email you with some of them because <clears throat> not not to you know not to prolong the meeting longer than than necessary. But they are really t technical questions about the the descriptions that are in the in the in in in, in the report. Um, right. Can I then ask the leader? Do you wish to make any comments, leader? No, Chair, I'm quite happy. I've, I've already made a, a short contribution to this, but happy to take political questions if people have them. OK, and anyone got any questions for the leader? No, I think the only thing is, leader, that I would, oh, sorry, pa Councillor Paxton Williams had just seen your hand up. <coughs> Thank you, Chairman. Um, it probably would be unusual if I didn't say anything at all. But I think I will say what I will say is essentially I think everybody's welcoming this increase in the budget. There's no two ways about that. Certainly from what I saw coming forward from the scrutiny panels yesterday, there was really a lot of um, pleasure, I suppose is the right word in terms of the increases that have been in that area. Um, I'm only going to make a very small point. I know the, the <laughs> I, I know the leader has spoken about the steady budgets. And I've explained enough to you that the austerity has always been implied, applied by Welsh Government rather than central government. And I'm not going to say any more on that, but I will say in terms of this budget, the extra money that is around, of course, is because all the additional funding that is coming from Welsh Government can only come because the Westminster Government has provided that funding in the first place. I just make that point, Chairman, if uh, <coughs> and, uh, and leave that. Thank you. I'm sure, Leader, you would like to respond to that. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm quite amazed, to be honest with you, that uh, Councillor Paxton Williams believes that austerity is a policy of the Welsh Government and not the UK Government. It was the mainstay of the Cameron and Clegg uh, coalition government for, for many years and, and in Mr Osborne's main economic policy, um, you know, pay down the debt. It's, it was a Tory policy um, that was introduced and, and has blighted this country for 10 years. I'm glad that it has gone. And as I said previously, what this year shows us is when the Treasury in Westminster turns on the taps, we all get a little bit of water. Um, but we need that water to flow every year. And um, unfortunately, what we've had is a government in, in London who's been absolutely intent on starving local government and starving public services of the necessary finances over the last 10 years. So very pleased to see that, very pleased actually that the Welsh Government were able to give us extra protection in those early years. And I'm very pleased to see the Welsh Government allocating a healthy slice of the pie to local government in Wales this year to help us fund all of the critical services that we deliver. So thank you to Councillor Paxton Woodlands for allowing me to comment on that one. Yeah, he, he did slip it in because, as I said to you before, this is not a political. This is not the place so, for political. Sorry, sorry, from both sorry, of you. sorry, Chairman. I haven't mentioned any parties or whatever at all associated with this. I know I've been told off about it in the past. I will just remind the leader for what it's worth that when he first came into power, uh, now about 2012, for the next eight or nine years, there was no increase in the RSG coming from Welsh government to. <coughs> Council in Swansea, whereas there was extra money coming to Welsh Government from Westminster at that time. It's a simple fact. If you look at the RSG figures, you can go back and look okay. at them. You're in, you're out, you're in, you're out. They didn't increase until the last couple of years. Can I, can I suggest, Councillor Paxton, really to leave this till the full council meet then? Because we are here to scrutinise the, the actual budget report. If you want to make a political statement, please make it at that time. So and that think, applies to you as well. Said, said, what did they say? Uh, yeah, I know you? what you said, but it, I, that applies to the leader as well. Can I ask just one question of the leader? And that is about the summary of savings proposal, table two. I I haven't got the page number, but it's paragraph 5.3. It's um, savings, specific savings as of the 20th of January 2020, 4.7 million. Um, it doesn't uh, doesn't require any redundancies or anything. Um, it does. It, there is a breakdown on the savings, but in all honesty, it's such a vague, <laughs> vague, um, a vague figure about uh, where those where those savings are going to come from. I just want to know that there's no jobs employed in that, and I thank thank the uh, the fact. There is in in the report the fact there will be no redundancies in it. Can I confirm that that is the case? Uh, 
Yeah, so certainly um, for the Central Council, um, there are no redundancies. There are a number of vacant posts. Um, uh, I think there were three at the at the last count. I think when I check Mr Smith, uh, that were potentially uh, posts at risk, but no, they were vacant posts. Um, there are we've given a commitment on no redundancies this year. Obviously, uh, depending on the school's position, schools may make different decisions. But as Mr Smith has said, the, the settlement to schools this year in terms of funding has been extremely well received by by the heads and the school's budget forum. Uh, and again, I would hope that no school is in a, in a position where they need to make uh, a redundancy decision. But of course, that will be for the head and the governor uh, governors to make that decision. OK, um, any other questions to the leader? Right, if that's the case, then thank you all very much. Um, can I thank the leader for and the cabinet member for discussion and the, sorry, and the treasurer, Mr. Smith, to give us uh, that report. Obviously, we'll make up. We, when I come to budget, I will give you actually an update from what the performance panel wish to say. Right, can we move on then to item seven, which is sustainable Swansea. Uh, verbal update, um, and that's uh, Mr. Ben Smith and Councillor Rob Stewart. Ben, do you want to say anything in this? Chair, yes, very briefly. This is a, a, an item that you've requested, and regrettably, um, the, the more relevant officers and members aren't available to directly respond to the project stroke program element of this. But I did indicate to give you a brief update, and clearly, from a narrow finance point of view, given you've got the third quarter monitoring report that says other than if COVID hadn't existed, services were under spending. I am relaxed enough to indicate that overall, whatever proposals were put up when the budget was set have been met either by those direct savings or by compensating savings. But I'm sure in due course, the scrutiny panel will want to come back and have a full written up mop up report from the relevant officers and members, both in terms of an outturn position for sustainable Swansea and how it segs into achieving better to, together. I think that's all I can say at this point in time in terms of from a quite a narrow finance field, but the re relevant officers and members will, will be available in due course to, to, to update on it. I think you'll be aware that there are a raft of items that we've put on pause in terms of monitoring. It's one that I've put on pause in terms of monitoring the finances through the year on the basis that overall we were underspending. Once you stripped COVID out, there was no compelling need to look at it, but I'm sure panel will want to come back to it in due course. Thank you. OK, Leader. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. Just, just to add to what Mr Smith said, I think, look again, uh, the, I think the, the key thing here was that it delivered uh, what it was expected to. Uh, but as Mr Smith said, uh, over the course of that whole programme, there were obviously some savings that were substituted in in order for us to stay on track in terms of the numeric targets that we had. I think um, as, as members will see when they get into the detail of, of the, the programme itself, the other thing that it enabled us to do was to stay away from the very worst impacts of austerity. Because uh, the, if you if you go back to the initial outline of the potential impacts on services that the uh, UK government's austerity programme could have caused for Swansea Council, um, you know we could have seen uh, savings required of up to fifty percent in certain departments, and we didn't need to make those cuts in the end. So I think uh, I think the the programme delivered what it needed to do, and and of course as Mr Smith has said, uh, both in the last uh, couple of years and hopefully this year again, we will be in a surplus position where we have departments uh, slightly underspending, uh, and therefore we are in a strong uh, and stable and robust financial position. That isn't the case everywhere. Uh, and again, I think that is a uh, testament really to the way in which uh, you know all members and the unions and staff have worked together to make sure we deliver the, the necessary changes and savings out of the uh, Sustainable Swansea Fit for the Future programme. OK, thank you very much. Um, any comments or questions? I, I have a couple of comments about this data. You know, the, the, the fact is <clears throat> we get verbal updates. I accept that because of the current situation. But we've done a lot. I've done a lot of commissioning reviews uh, since 2013, 14, and we've done a um, mock We've done a wash up of some of them, but not all of them. And part of that underlying the the whole principle of sustain, uh, sustainable Swansea. And I think one of the issues that we will be bringing up, maybe not in this panel, but at some stage in the future, is we need to go and revisit that because many of those um, 
commissioner reviews have never been acted on or been acted on in a in a way which didn't come forward with the savings that that you hoped and everybody else hoped they did. And I think one of the other things is the way in which a uh, sustainable swans is being reported. Um, I think again, you know, we've never had a, if you like, a comprehensive report about how it's being implemented across the whole patch. So I think that's the issue um, that will come back to us and as I say it won't be in this panel at the moment it'll be at some time in the future but to let you know that I think that in in any formal letter that we'll send we I think that's what we'll have to say that in future there needs to be a comprehensive examination of the commissioning reviews and uh, further updates on the sustainable Swansea okay yeah, Chair, just to, just to say that I think it would be really helpful um, if you can be specific on that, because as you quite rightly say, there have been a number of updates. And again, if there are specific bits that are not in those updates that the panel are interested in, then obviously we can seek to address that. I think the, the other thing I would say is just uh, I, I would I would um, disagree somewhat in terms of the uh, Commission reviews not delivering what they uh, intended. I think as Mr Smith indicated, and it's a discussion we've had with auditors previously, is that um, the, the Sustainable Swansea Fit for the Future programme delivered significant savings, but given the uh, emerging landscape that we had, sometimes we had to substitute in additional or alternative savings um, to make sure that we still met the quantum of what was needed to be required in terms of an overall saving. So you might not have delivered exactly in the way that you intended to and you started the process, but you still delivered um, what you needed to at the end. So that that was one of the things that I think we, we just wanted to make sure was clear here because there inevitably will be at the start of any budget year, you know, you know, it's it's strange given that where we are at the moment where we're looking at huge investment going into services. You've got to remember a few years back, you were looking at taking 20 million pounds out every year and therefore you had to have a you had to have a program that gave you uh, sufficient detail to get to that 20 million in terms of savings. Well, mm. of course, as you would then progress through the year, sometimes you weren't able to achieve some of the savings to the same degree that you'd liked when you first uh, discussed them. So that's where some changes then came in and some substitutions came in over the period of the year or over the period of the program. So it's just, it was a bit of a movable feast. Um, but again, you know, more than happy to have that discussion and, and look at the detail of how it panned out. But again, to say that they didn't deliver, I think, would be unfair because they, they clearly did. Well, I'll give you an example, Leader. You know, some of the ones like the cleaning ones and what have you, the, the savings didn't come up to what was projected. But then again, on the other side, you had the, the professional services given by place, which were more than more than well, they, they were they were actually better than what the private sector could ever have done. So yes, there they was, but others were complementary. They were they were really good, and, for, and especially in the professional services. So I think there's an issue that when we did the last sort of wash up of them, um, they, they, we didn't have the information necessary to say yes, that was really successful, or this is what was wrong with that commissioning review, which underpins sustainable Swansea. But I think that at some time in the future that will have to be discussed, but I don't think that's for today or prior to the election in 2000, uh, prior to the election in May. Okay. okay. Right, Doth. Any further comments on that, item seven? OK, can I thank uh, Mr Ben Smith and the leader, Councillor Rob Stewart, for attending today to go through these items. Um, you're more than welcome to stay, but I'm assuming that you would prefer to go and have a cup of tea or something uh, than just, <laughs> as we discuss the work plan and then then go on to annual review. OK, thank, thank, thank you. Thank you, very thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Committee. Appreciate it. Next item is number eight, the work plan. Um, any issues on that? Emily, I don't know if you want to share the work plan on the. Yes, don't need chair. Just bear with me a moment, please. Can everybody see the screen there? Everybody all right, or do you want it enlarged? Yeah, it is a bit small. There we are, great. Okay. 
Yes, right. fine. You, fine with me. Right, if you go then to this meet, particular meeting. Right, we've gone. The obviously the the next the next meeting will be the um, well. To some extent, we've cancelled it because of the various issues that the fact that it's going to be in Perder as well. Um, so any issues? Because <coughs> I would like. Um, OK. All right, Emily, you can take it down. Right. The. Number nine is the annual review. Um, again, I don't know, Emily, can you put this up? Certainly, bear with me, please. OK. I think once more, yeah. OK. Um, obviously, this is the final meeting of the municipal year. And um, if we can go through it um, and see what went well, this is what I will have to report back to cabinet at some stage. The you see that some of the issues that are brought up. If you can go on to the next page, Emily, uh, went a bit too far there. <laughs> right, if we leave it there. Um, in practical terms, it's seen what we've done, and um, we understand. And everybody, I think, has uh, cooperated in, entirely and very well with the panel. I'm not sure if there's any comments any members want to make about what what went well and what didn't go well. Well, I think you know. Sorry, can I say anything? Or yeah, by all means, carry on. Yeah, I thought you know what went well. It, it was good, really, that we. Uh, so we said had access to information that we you know wouldn't have had with, without the plan and actually taking place. I must admit uh, what didn't go well. Um, and I know you know this is probably COVID related and so on. Um, I especially today with regards to the you know the papers on the budget. I wish you know we could have had paper copies actually supplied to us. I find it extremely difficult to actually go through reports especially financial reports on a computer you know you know to make notes and so on is horrendously difficult and i think you know any if this actually carries on you know i think we need to have some sort of paper copy actually supplied to us okay um anyone else i don't see any other hands up uh, well, well, I think the what went well is the fact that we were able to to have quite a number of cabinet members and leaders here whenever we requested them. Um, we've done some good work on um, the finance and and on on performance. I think on performance because of COVID, it's been a little bit surreal. Uh, in as much as we've been performing, we've been scrutinising performance data for the last two years, which to, to some extent didn't make a lot of sense. Um, and especially, you know, in, in some of the non in social services, there were some that could be, you know, readily made available. But I'll take and, and for instance, absence under the, in the last two years, absence has been horrendous. But what do you expect with the pandemic? So I think, you know, some of the things have gone well. Um, such as say such as the scrutiny as uh, such as the scrutiny of finance and of um, some of the services planning was particularly good because it's the first time that at any time as a scrutiny panel looked at the workings of planning um so i think all in all there are some issues that went well i think there are other issues and especially about the um, performance data i think weren't was really in many ways just a just an exercise in 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 what was what was available not and not what the true uh, figures of performance were okay so i think we can uh, take that down please emily
OK, are there any comments about that? Any more comments? If not, can I th uh, move on? To, well, before we go on to that, um, over the last, obviously, oh, sorry, Irene. Oh, I'm so sorry. I just wanted to um, reinforce the comment you made on planning. I thought that was extremely interesting and has positive and concrete outcomes where we now have um, a monthly enforcement uh, update as well. Just wanted to say uh, thank you for that. I thought that was excellent work. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. Um, right, if there's no other comments, can I say um, as been pointed out this is the last meeting of the year and also the last meeting before the next election. Um, I'm not sure how many of you will be with us after May the 5th, but uh, thank you all for your contributions and, and you've all helped to, to make this panel successful and um, I just wish you the best of luck in the future. OK, item 10 is letters. OK, item Anybody, any comments about the letters? No, I can't see any hands going up. Right, OK, can we move on to item 11, which is the exclusion of the public? Can somebody move? Yeah. Um, yeah. I move uh, you, Chairman. Paxton and Jeff Jones. So Paxton and Williams and Councillor Jeff Jones have both moved and seconded the exclusion of the public. Right, OK, then we come on to the property investment fund strategy. Um, Chair, if I may uh, stop the recording, please. Yes, please. Okay. <laughs>